Hello, my name is Luke, and welcome to Scapegoat, the podcast where we see who gets the blame and who gets away with murder, sometimes literally. This year is the 25 year anniversary of the Disney movie Aladdin. Aladdin helped introduce Disney to a whole new world of children. However, behind the scenes, there was a bitter conflict between Disney and the movie's star, Robin Williams. After the movie was released, Robin stated that he would never make another Disney movie. And Disney accused Robin of being unprofessional and having sour grapes, but What's the true story? Did Robin Williams really do something completely horrific? Or did the House of Mouse break all their promises and then scapegoat the actor? Well, we're going to cover this and more in this week's Scapegoat. So we're going to start off and do a short autobiography of Robin Williams before Aladdin. And Robin Williams was born in Chicago in 1951 to a wealthy family, with his father being a senior executive at the Ford Motor Company and his mother being a model. Growing up, he was quiet and shy, but excelled at drama. The school subject, not like Twitter drama, but you'll know that. Because of his father's job, he had to frequently move between states, so he rarely got to keep friends. And he finished off his uh, high school in California, where he was voted most likely to not succeed, but he was also voted the funniest person. So we can see a character who's a bit shy, a bit funny, a bit introverted, but he isn't seen to be going places. Much to the shock of most people, he got into the Juilliard School for the Performing Arts, and he excelled so well at Juilliard, which is an extremely selective school, his teacher suggested he leave a year early, as Juilliard had nothing more that they could possibly teach him. Robin moved back to California, to San Francisco, and he started his comedy career. With his comedy career, he started doing a lot of stand-up, and he's quickly noted by producers. He got cast in the television show Mork and Mindy, which is a major network hit between 1978 and 1982. He became quite a major television star, but he always had his eye on film, so that's what he was trying to break into. And in 1980, he had the movie Popeye. Although people praised his performance, the movie was a flop. He did another couple of movies which are also flops, such as uh, The World According to Garp, The Survivors, Club Paradise. And all of them were not critically successful and not commercially successful. Although most of them were profitable, they weren't profitable enough. It looked like the Robin Williams bubble was bursting and he'd be stuck in television for the rest of his career. However, he got a very lucky break in 1987, where Barry Levinson cast him into the movie Good Morning Vietnam. And this role was really a breakout film role for Robin Williams. It gave him the opportunity to show his talent at ad-libbing, with Levinson letting Williams pretty much improvise all of his lines. It brought him critical acclaim, with him being nominated for an Academy Award. And via this, he suddenly became a big movie star and could start choosing his own roles. So he began choosing roles such as the Dead Poet Society, where he got an Academy Award, or, or the Fisher King Rover in 1991, which he also got an Academy Award, or Hook, which was a Steven Spielberg movie and also got him a lot of critical acclaim. During this period, Williams also released two comedy albums, which got the Grammy for the best comedy album of the year in 1988 and 1989. So we can see the movie Good Morning Vietnam turned Robin Williams from a television star into a mega star. And in early 1991, Barry Levinson, who was the director of Good Morning Vietnam, again approached Williams to star in another one of his movies. Levinson had co-written a script for a movie called Toys in the early 80s, but he could never find a studio who was willing to buy or produce the script. However, after 10 years of production hell, the movie had finally been greenlit. Robin Williams, seeing the script, fell in love with the movie, and it became his passion project. The movie began filming in late 1992, or a late 1992 release date. So it was actually summer 1992 when it was being filmed, 1992 late release date. So this is the movie Robin Williams absolutely loved, and he was willing to put his neck out on the line to make this. Simultaneously to this, with the rise of Robin Williams, the Disney company was also on the rise. Disney had previously been America's top animation studio since the 1930s, but it had been in turmoil since the death of Walt Disney and his younger brother Roy. So during the 1970s and 80s, the company began to lose a lot of prestige that they had built up during Walt Disney's lifetimes. Movies such as The Fox and the Hound, The Aristocats and The Black Cauldron failed to make the mark that Dumbo, Bambi, or Snow White had previously done. During this period, 
former Disney animator Don Bluth started his own company and his movies, for instance, The Secret of Nin, The Land Before Time and An American Tale, eclipsed Disney in sales. So it looked like Disney was falling out of grace with Americans and with general box office. So Disney was completely slipping. So in an emergency move in 1984, Disney appointed a brand new CEO called Michael Eisner, who brought in a man called Jeffrey Katzenberg to revitalize the Disney brand. Katzenberg started off by funding more of Disney's adult movies under the label Touchstone, and ironically actually uh, funded the Robin Williams movie Good Morning Vietnam. But where they really wanted to start making prestige films were with animation, where Disney traditionally came from. Katzenberg began production on two animated movies, one based on the Hans Christian Andersen's Little Mermaid story, which Disney had been trying to develop since the 1930s. The other was a remake of the story of Oliver Twist with animals called Oliver and Company. Katzenberg believed both movies would be highly profitable, but he believed Oliver would outperform The Little Mermaid as The Little Mermaid was a girls' film, and it would be Disney's number one smash, which would, which would make Disney an animated juggernaut again. But much to his surprise, The Little Mermaid, which came out in 1989, was a smash hit, and it destroyed Oliver in the box office, and soon became Disney's first blockbuster for 25 years. Disney immediately tried to replicate the success by greenlighting the production of Beauty and the Beast for a 1991 release, and began work on a second project based off the story of Aladdin from the stories of Arabian Nights, were for a late 1992 release. Disney badly wanted Aladdin to be another smash hit and wanted a famous actor attached to the project to try and help sell it. When designing the genie character, they pretty much said, who's the number one comedian? They looked at the stand-up albums, they looked at who was selling movies, and they thought, Robin Williams. So they tried to pitch Robin Williams the script. And they were that certain that they wanted Robin. For all their test data, they designed the genie to look like him, and they designed the storyboards around Robin Williams' sketches. So when they showed Robin Williams this, they actually showed him one of his stand-up clips, but instead of him doing it, it was the genie, and it was actually a very funny stand-up clip if you ever get to see it. It was very good test footage. Now, Williams had been a long-time Disney animation fan, and was happy to do the project, as he wanted to leave something wonderful behind for his kids, to quote him. However, Disney wanted to pay Robin Williams scale. So scale for actors pretty much means that like you'll be paid a certain amount for the role. You can't choose your own wage like a lot of people do in Hollywood. So scale for a voice actor at the time was $75,000. Now that's huge money to you and me, but to Robin Williams it was nothing. For he was making about $8 million per pitch for each picture previously. So this was a massive amount less than he would be expecting to get. Now, Disney stated that the genie character was only a small side character, and Williams should take the pay cut as, you know, it was part of the animation tradition. Few people expected to be paid full money for doing an animated role. Williams pretty much straight off just agreed to take a 1,000% pay decrease because he wanted to do it and he thought it was a favour to Disney. But he had certain conditions. He said he would do this if Disney minimised the Williams in the advertisement for the film. Because Williams was worried that Aladdin, having such a close release date to his passion project, the Barry Levinson directed movie Toys, he believed that if he was used to advertise Aladdin, it would reduce the number of people who went to see Toys. So he made a handshake deal saying, look, I don't want to be used in more than 25% of the advertising, and I do not want to be more than 25% of the genie in the poster. And he also said, I do not want to be involved in any sales advertising, such as toys, fast foods, general merchandise tie-ins. So I'll do this for 75 grand, but you have to pretty much respect me. Don't use me in advertising, apart from advertising the movie, and you can only use me for 25% of that. And Disney thought, hmm, we're getting Robin Williams for 75 grand. Deal. So Williams soon began to record dialogue for his character, with Disney encouraging him to improvise as he had done with Good Morning Vietnam. Disney ended up with dozens of hours of material supplied by Williams. Due to the surplus of material, Disney animators began to increase the size of the character, which had originally began as a bit character, and moving him more into being a main character. And also through focus groups, Disney realized that Williams' part was 
the audience's favorite. They pretty much, they had a hit performance on their hand and was all via Robin Williams. So to make the movie a success, like they had with The Little Mermaid, they needed to rely on Robin Williams, which is against their agreement. How did Disney break their agreement? Well, for the first released theatrical poster, it didn't break the agreement with Williams. The poster was simply Aladdin's arm holding a lamp and a little bit of genie magic dust coming out of the lamp, but, you know, didn't show Williams, didn't really name him on the poster, so, you know, that was fine with Williams. However, the second poster really upset Williams because while it he wasn't in more than 25% of it, it was the biggest 25%. So they had the genie in the background as a huge character, then pretty much Aladdin and Jasmine only taking up like 5% of it. So it looked like the genie was the main character and the main advertising focus. And this badly upset Williams. Williams was also left furious by the agreement because they started to use Williams in the advertising for the film by more than 25% of the speaking lines. And were certainly using Williams' character to advertise toys and food products and any kind of tie-ins. They had completely broken that agreement with Williams. He was left even more furious when Aladdin became quickly the best-selling animated movie of all time and raked in half a billion dollars in tickets. Now, this didn't upset Williams as much as his movie Toys, which came out the next month, only got... 23 million dollars with a 50 million dollar budget it was a complete box office flop and williams blamed this due to overexposure of himself via being used for the advertisements by disney so he thought because people have seen me so much advertise as disney they're a little bit sick of me and they didn't go see toys and this broke my agreement with disney so in the aftermath of this disagreement robin williams began publicly to criticize disney and said they had broken their agreement with him. In interviews, Williams said, to quote, the only reason Mickey Mouse has free fingers is because he can't pick up a check. He spoke about his upset about being used to sell products to people, saying that he had hated it ever since his Mork and Mindy days, when he had found Mork and Mindy dolls mutilized in a trash can. Pretty much it was something he never wanted to do again in his career. Well, Disney representatives replied to Williams saying, he was unprofessional, he had sour grapes because the movie had been a box office smash and Williams didn't get a cut. They began publicly to paint a picture of Williams as someone who was money hungry and didn't care about the art of movies. All he cared about was the bottom line. They also claimed the agreement that he had previously made was not legally valid. It was merely a handshake agreement and they had rang Williams' uh, wife, Marsha, and she had agreed to the changes. So. He legally couldn't sue them. Williams wasn't trying to sue them, but they said, you can't sue us because it was a handshake agreement and your wife agreed to it. Almost immediately, Disney began to suffer bad publicity because of the Robin Williams feud. So to try and break this, they publicly sent him a Picasso worth $1 million as an apology. Williams wasn't happy with the gift, seeing it as an attempt to buy his silence on this issue. And he discussed with Monty Python's Eric Idle, burning the painting on live television as a sign of defiance. During this time, Disney also approached William saying, oh, the genie character is really popular. Can we use him in the sequel, The Return of Jafar? And Robin Williams pretty much said, no, no, you'll never get me to agree to do another thing again. So during the next year at the Golden Globe ceremony, because they hadn't really had an animated category before, they gave Robin Williams an honorary award for playing the genie so well. I forget what the exact title of the award was, but it was like Dedication to Animation Award or something. He gets the award, and during his speech, he doesn't mention the movie, the character, or Disney once. The only reference he made to Disney in an award he's getting accepting for winning, <laughs> for playing a Disney character, the only reference he made during the entire thing was to point at Jeffrey Katzenberg and call him Katzenbug as an insult. And that's the only thing he did during the speech. Throughout the year, Williams turned down any project by Disney or funded by Disney to the extent that uh, when Mrs. Doubtfire producer Joe Roth sent him a script, Williams found out it was co-financed by Disney and he sent back the pages unread with a note explaining he had an issue with the studio and didn't want to make the film. And Joe Roth was a dear friend of Robin Williams. You know, it was not personal, but... He just would never deal with Disney. Jeffrey Katzenberg, the man behind all this trouble, in 1994, 
he was trying to maneuver himself to being second in charge of Disney. So he was going to Michael Eisner and saying, oh, you know, I should be second in charge. Look, I'm causing this Disney renaissance with the Beauty and the Beast hit, Rescuers Down Under hit, Little Mermaid hit. I'm a hit machine. Make me second in charge. Uh, Michael Eisner didn't really like this. So Katzenberg got the boot. And Joe Roth, who was uh, Robin Williams' friend, the producer from Mrs. Doubtfire, ended up taking his job. Joe had an excellent working relationship with Robin, so he decided to see if he could heal the feud. So what he said was, There is no question in my mind that we need to apologize to Robin Williams for not diffusing the issue in the media that appeared that he only cared about money. Roth told the Los Angeles Times, I've known Robin for years, and I know none of these things are ever about money with him. They are simply about principle. Now this apology worked, and Williams himself told the Times, Just when people are getting burned left and right in Hollywood, look, an act of kindness. So he almost immediately returned to the fold because he had got an apology. That's all he had really wanted. And now that Jeffrey Katzenberg was out of the picture, he realised that people knew he wasn't being scapegoated, and he wasn't the real problem, and it wasn't him caring about money but he just cared about the principle of it. He graciously returned to the fold for the third Aladdin film, Aladdin, Prince of Thieves. He returned. The person who was, did the voice for the second film was kicked off, who was ironically Dan Castellaneta, who was the voice of Homer Simpson. They had already recorded the lines for the third movie, but they said, hey, we've got Robin Williams instead of uh, Homer Simpson. We're going to take Robin Williams. He re-recorded that, and yep, that everything went peacefully, and... Robin Williams continued to make Disney films from that point. So we're going to look at the aftermath of what happened to people's careers after this. Robin Williams had a lot of positive movies throughout the early 90s. For instance, he had Jumanji, which is a major hit. He had Hook, which was actually slightly before this, but again, a major hit. And Good Will Hunting, the Matt Damon, Ben Affleck film, where he won an Oscar. But throughout this period, slightly after it, about 1997... His movie roles began to get poorer and poorer, as in poorer and poorer choice of movies. So there was the Francis Ford Coppola movie, Jack. And you think Francis Ford Coppola, this is going to be great. It wasn't a great movie. Then there was Patch Adams. Again, not a great movie. And the original Patch Adams hated it and denounced it. So it was bad publicity for Robin Williams. Then he made Bicentennial Man. Also an awful film. So... By the end of the decade, by about 2000, Robin Williams star not really going as well as it had been the previous decade. Although he did make some great movies, for instance, One Hour Photo, where he played a crazy person. And honestly, I think he's a better actor than he was a comedian, because that movie was scary as hell. For, as for Katzenberg, he moved on and he formed DreamWorks, which started making Shrek, which is a very anti-Disney movie, if you look at it. Uh, Pretty much it's just filled with Disney characters looking grotesque or parodying Disney things such as like Robin Hood and you know, it's generally Katzenberg hated Disney. One more thing I'm going to mention here is the Disney Renaissance, which happened during this period, which was from Beauty and the Beast to Tarzan. That Katzenberg did help launch this, but it wasn't entirely him. And this was a ten movie period where in which include movies like Mulan, Pocahontas, Tarzan, Lion King, Hercules, Hunchback of Notre Dame. And this really launched Disney into the stratosphere again and made them an animation domination and made them pretty awesome. So this whole Robin Williams certainly helped that and he didn't get paid well for it unless you go to Picasso. But I don't think that was the point. There's a movie called The Thief and the Cobbler, which was being produced since the 1960s, which... Had a very similar story to Aladdin, and a lot of people who worked on Aladdin previously worked on The Thief and the Cobbler, but that's another story. It was by Richard Williams, and I felt if I was saying Williams too much, it would get confusing for people. But again, look up Thief and the Cobbler if you can, and you might be able to notice Jafar and Zigzag are very similar characters. And finally, I want to say, I always find the line, don't close your eyes during a whole new world was a creepy line. I just want to put that out there. So that was a creepy line. He shouldn't have been declaring that Jasmine should never close her eyes. But that's just my opinion. Okay, thanks very much. I've been recording this on a new microphone. Maybe it isn't set up. Um, there might be a bit of an echo, but 
Hopefully not. Uh, yeah, thanks very much for listening. You can contact me at scapegoatpod on Twitter or scapegoatpodcast at gmail.com. I'd like to thank everyone who has given me positive feedback. And so far, nobody's given me negative feedback apart from the one crazy BMP woman for the uh, Queen episode. But that's something <laughs> I'd rather not go into. My head now, but uh, okay, guys, thanks very much. I'll talk to you again. Okay, bye bye.